Sony's PlayStation 5 is currently dominating the market, and its upcoming exclusives will probably secure its place on the mountaintop. We're not saying, oh, PS5 is best console, lol. We are aware that Xbox still has a handful of cards to play, and surprisingly, it's not what a lot of people seem to be talking about. Xbox clearly has a long-term strategy currently in play right now. It's a simple mix of classic IPs, Game Pass, and all those acquisitions that have occurred over the last few years. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. My name is Ty with Mojo Plays, and today we're taking a look at how Xbox could dethrone the PlayStation 5. We've been running as Xbox, so now we can actually start to sit down and really build our plans together, and that I can't yeah, wait. This is, this is day awesome. one. I mean, yeah. Before we begin, we publish new content all week long, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Sony already has made its plans for the PlayStation 5 public. Well, plans for the next few months to a year, anyways. In addition to several third-party titles, PS5 players can look forward to Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, Gran Turismo 7, Returnal, Horizon Forbidden West, and the sequel to 2018's God of War, which is tentatively titled God of War Ragnarok, at least by the public. Sony is going to keep doing what it has been doing for the last handful of years, shell out a few big exclusive first-party titles to use as tentpole launches, make one or two of them open world, and make bank. It's a strategy that's been going well for them, and is partially why the PS4 was so successful. Even Nintendo uses a similar marketing strategy, making launches full-blown marketing events. Xbox can easily replicate this strategy, as it owns many franchises that resonate with people, and Xbox knows this. Since its release in 2013, Killer Instinct has amassed over 10 million players between Xbox consoles and PC, which is more than enough to call it a flagship franchise. A recent Twitch Rivals event with Maximilian Dude was loud enough to show how important the game is in the fighting game community. The world lost its mind when Banjo and Kazooie were revealed for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and even head of Xbox Phil Spencer took note of this. The same thing happened when Master Chief made his way into Fortnite. Psychonauts received a large enough following for Double Fine to make a sequel despite the first game being a commercial failure. While the 2020 Battletoads reboot and 2019's Crackdown 3 weren't really shiners, Xbox is well aware of how valuable their IP is, and there are two games that serve as examples that more franchises could be returning. Though Halo Infinite didn't look pretty when we first saw it, the game was delayed an entire year just so 343 Industries could go back and rework the visuals. After the franchise has been dormant for six years, the last main game was Halo 5 Guardians, Xbox and 343 clearly want to get this right and make Infinite a triumphant return for the franchise. Then you have Fable, the next title in the comedic action RPG being developed by Playground Games. If you've played Forza Horizon 4, you know very well that this studio knows how to have fun with its own games. And while we have yet to see gameplay of the new Fable, it's safe to say that the franchise is in the right hands. But yours has yet to be written. Basically, Xbox is looking to dish out new games for classic IPs that have been neglected for years, and this could really help them in the long run, considering how Sony has been treating its own classic IPs as of late. When Medieval was gearing up for launch in October 2019, PlayStation did little to no marketing for the game, only pumping out a few short trailers and an episode of PlayStation Underground that didn't really talk about the franchise's significance. We hope it does well. Sly Cooper has been absent from the platform since the fourth game launched in 2013 on PS3, and while the raccoon was used as an avatar in a PS5 showcase, there's no sign of him returning. Plus, there was that animated series we were supposed to get in 2016 that we haven't heard of since. It doesn't help that Sucker Punch has moved on from both Sly and the infamous games, and is now focusing on Ghost of Tsushima or whatever else that they're working on next. You seem to be getting the hang of your, uh... New symptoms, right? <laughs> and of course, the only downside being that, uh... Nope, can't think of anything. This is pretty freaking awesome. Speaking of devs that have moved on to other projects, Guerrilla Games has been busy with the Horizon franchise. Its previous franchise, Killzone, is nowhere to be found. 
literally. Like, you type in killzone.com and it just brings you to the PlayStation Store. It no longer exists. You'd think a franchise once classified as Sony's Halo killer would be top priority right now, but womp womp. However, one of Sony's biggest blunders when handling its heritage, and a personal attack on me, involves the Twisted Metal series. On the day Twisted Metal turned 25, there was zero acknowledgement of the anniversary from Sony. Not through PlayStation blog posts, not through social media, not a video, not an announcement, not a damn thing. Instead, we were given a video showcasing Destruction All-Stars, as if we were supposed to get Twisted Metal ever happen. And what happened when Destruction All-Stars launched? Lukewarm reviews from critics and players. Sony is burning its older player base quite a bit, and with Xbox wanting to bring older IPs back, this could put Xbox at a bit of an advantage when trying to appease older fans. Let me see what I can find. Cannons first. When I get back, we can look. Still, it's going to take more than just nostalgia for Xbox, and don't you worry, they have more cards to play. Another big part of their strategy lies in Xbox Game Pass, their landmark subscription service where players pay a small fee and get access to over 100 games every month. Unlike Sony's subscription service, PlayStation Now, you don't stream the games. You can download them and play them as you would with any purchased title. On top of that, the catalog gets updated twice a month with new games to try, and you can even net points for Microsoft rewards through Game Pass, allowing you to potentially get some free Xbox money. Is the deal still not sweet enough for you? Well, you can usually catch a deal on Game Pass. For example, I was able to nab one month of Game Pass Ultimate, which includes Xbox Live Gold, for one US dollar. And I got two months for free with it. So hey, more gaming for me at a lower cost. Xbox is obviously trying to win new customers with sweet deals, and the bargaining got more intense when we were gearing up for the launch of the Series XS. Upon revealing the console's price tags, Xbox simultaneously announced a payment plan known as Xbox All Access. This would allow those on a tighter budget to buy the console without having to make a single hefty purchase. Now one can pay over the span of a few months and do so without any interest tacked on and get two years of Game Pass Ultimate. So really, if you're someone constantly spending money on games and need a grip on your budget, or if you want to be smarter with your money, Xbox may very well be up your alley. So what, you're saying sales and retro games are going to put Xbox on top? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. There's still a couple more things to cover, so let's hold our horses here. Remember how there was a period when it seemed like Xbox was just buying everyone just to put them under the Xbox umbrella? Well, those studios most likely play a hand in why the Series XS has had a quiet, arguably uneventful launch. We're simply in the calm before the storm, the incubation period where we can catch up on our backlogs and get to know our machines before the bigger releases come. And my, there's a good number of games to look forward to. Team Ninja is currently working on a sequel to Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice as they wind down support for Bleeding Edge. The initiative is working on a Perfect Dark revival, which confirms a rumor from long ago regarding Rareware IPs going to different studios. We even saw this with Battletoads, where Rareware was only a supervisor and helped developer Dalala Studios. Speaking of Rare, Sea of Thieves is seeing a bit of a resurgence with its continued support, and the UK-based studio is busy creating their next game, Everwild, which looks stunning. Obsidian Entertainment has launched a second expansion to the Outer Worlds, and it's the final one, and is currently developing a charming survival game known as Grounded, whereas Turn 10 Studios is still tinkering with the next Forza Motorsport game. An Xbox Summer event was dropped during a discussion with Bethesda recently too, and we have a hunch we'll be seeing some of these pop up again, as well as games from studios like Compulsion Games, In Exile Entertainment, and Undead Labs. Needless to say, there is a lot 
to look forward to. What makes the studios under Xbox so unique is that they all tailor to different experiences and genres. You have your adventure games, your shooters, platformers, RPGs, fighting games, etc. And they are all genres that can be found within the first party sector of Xbox. It's a palette that appeals to the gamer looking for new experiences. The gamer that wants to dip their toes into different things they may not have tried before. However, Xbox is providing those experiences in a very specific way, and it all ties back into Game Pass. Take me for example. I was intimidated by the fast paced nature of Killer Instinct at first, but because of Game Pass, I ended up downloading it, and now it's all I ever want to talk about. You can ask Ricky, I mention it almost every single meeting. See, when you take away the possibility of financial consequences, you open the door for more players to try things they may not have thought about playing. It's called explosive cell death, but it's really more of a liquefaction. Something wrong? This has been especially evident when certain studios have come forward about the benefits of putting their games on Game Pass. For example, when talking to Eurogamer, Doublefine, Obsidian, and a few indie devs noted that they had benefited in both funding and player engagement because of Game Pass, with some players even ending up buying the game after playing them on Game Pass. There's money to be made, long as you keep your nose clean. Somehow, Xbox has found a way to, more or less, remove admission price from games through a subscription service and still make it beneficial for studios, players, and themselves. But how do you get more players on Xbox and on Game Pass? Easy. You make your own games available on Game Pass on launch day, which is exactly what Xbox is doing and will continue to do. See an exclusive you're interested in, but don't know if you want to pay for it? Just buy Game Pass! Sony, on the other hand, is already crippling itself in the long run. They've recently sized down their own Japan studio, which was responsible for a lot of cult classics like Parappa the Rapper, Vib Ribbon, Everybody's Golf, my personal favorite, Gravity Rush, and Loco Roco. As a result, some of the staff will be moved to Asobi, the studio behind the PS5 launch title Astro's Playroom. To make matters worse, Sony is slowly getting a little more aggressive with the $70 debate, tacking their first party games with the price whether they're actually worth it or not. We were lucky they lowered Destruction All-Stars to 20 bucks. I'm still hesitant to say it's worth the price. Add in an unusually intense focus on open world games, and you have a concoction for a market that could be easily become oversaturated and stale in the near future. Variety is the spice of the games industry, and this has proven time and time again. The 1983 crash of the video game market, first person shooters in the late 2000s, Anthem releasing in an endless sea of live service games, the battle royale craze, I can keep going. If Sony keeps churning out open world games, it could really bite them in the backside. They already have at least three open world games, or games with open world elements, likely releasing within the next year. Horizon Forbidden West, Marvel's Spider-Man 2, and Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. No matter which way you look at it, Sony Studios are going to have to start doing more than just visuals to stand apart from each other. And then you have the bigger player in Xbox's plan, Bethesda. Yes, it sounds ridiculous at first considering how badly Bethesda has fallen in recent years. Trust me, no one is ever going to forget Fallout 76 and how almost all of Bethesda's IPs have been Cronenberged into live service games. However, Bethesda has a far bigger role in Xbox's strategy than it may seem, and it all lies within how Microsoft's acquisition has been worded. Head of Xbox Phil Spencer has said that Bethesda will be operating, quote, semi-independently, end quote, which means a number of things and yet is so definitive. I, I want to start, Phil, with you because you're the one who made all of this happen and had the vision for what this might be. And I wonder if you could start by sort of giving us your own words on how did this all come about? What Spencer is saying here is that Xbox will still call the shots on several things. And as Spencer has pointed out, many of Bethesda's titles will still be launching on other platforms, but whenever this is spoken, it is spoken under the phrase contractual obligations, as he puts it. So PlayStation fans don't have to fret about losing certain Bethesda games, but this could mean different for other games. 
most notably The Elder Scrolls VI and Starfield. These are the two biggest titles Bethesda has in the works right now, and neither game has been confirmed for specific platforms, only that Starfield could possibly be a cross-gen title. While Spencer has said they'll continue putting Bethesda titles on other platforms, Xbox can play the exclusivity card in more than one way, not just the obvious you can only play it here way. Future Bethesda games could potentially become timed exclusives, popping up on Xbox first and other platforms a year or two after release. We've seen this happen with several other titles in the past. Or, if Xbox wants to get a little dishonorable, they could have Bethesda prioritize Xbox optimization over PlayStation. Meaning, if you want to play a Bethesda game that looks and runs better, you're probably going to have to jump on Xbox. They're already making moves like this with their constantly updating FPS boost compatibility. How many of us have wanted to experience Skyrim or Dishonored or Fallout at a smoother frame rate? Well, now we can! And personally, it's reinvigorated my interest in playing those games. And from the looks of it, this is only the beginning of the plan to make Bethesda games look gorgeous on Xbox, while PlayStation users are stuck with the original formats. Heck, they could release games on every platform, but if you want DLC and expansions, you'll have to get the Xbox version. There are several ways that Xbox could make Bethesda games exclusive to their platform, and it isn't them being anti-consumer, it's just business. And we've said this in Xbox, as we've been planning for this moment for so long, this is an opportunity for us to learn. Many have claimed that the PS5 has already won this generation, and we may have jumped the gun as well, but Xbox has us in the waiting room, and time is just about up. With Summer Games Fest on the horizon, Xbox can very easily steal the competition in a number of ways, and they have a hell of a hand to make that happen. You know, Phil is someone I'm always calling and bouncing things off of, and as we talked, it became clearer and clearer that this kind of partnership was where we wanted to go with all of the games we were doing. It could happen earlier if reports of monthly announcements prove true. If there was anything Spencer has said that defines their strategy, it was this. Quote, This is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists. End quote. Where does Game Pass exist? Only on Xbox and PC. What does Game Pass offer? Not just open world games, but a wide selection of games from different genres and studios that could appeal to a lot of people. And who can afford Game Pass? Well, if you got 15 bucks, you can get the biggest package they offer. And that is how Xbox could dethrone the PlayStation 5. And what a commitment we have, and I have personally, um, to building an environment and a culture where creators feel like they can absolutely do their best work. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, there's more where that came from.